presentation of the. I want to welcome all of you to this afternoon's lecture, Restoration of the American Chestnut in Ontario. On a spring like day like this, you can probably imagine yourself having a picnic underneath a tree in a local park or in the country, and its green canopy is just beginning to appear. Now, 100 years ago, you probably would have been sitting under an American chestnut tree. There were an estimated three to four billion American chestnut trees across North America at the time, but they were mostly destroyed in a blight caused by a bark fungus that came from Asian chestnut trees that had been introduced into the US in the late 19th century. The nuts of this tree were once an important economic and medicinal resource. They were sold on city streets, especially at Christmas time when roasting on an open fire became a popular tune and roasting chestnuts could be smelled blocks away. And meanwhile, indigenous people used parts of the chestnut to treat a variety of elements, including whooping cough. Currently, the American chestnut is listed as an endangered species under the Ontario Endangered Species Act of 2007. This afternoon, we're gonna learn more about the American chestnut tree and the efforts of the Canadian Chestnut Council to restore the tree in its range, which includes Southern Ontario. But first, the Toronto Field Naturalist acknowledges that we are on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. These lands and rivers are now home to many First Nations, Inuit and Metis peoples, and are covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit. TFN, respecting the spirit and practice of reconciliation, continue to look for opportunities to connect people with nature on these lands. Now I would like to introduce Ron Cassier. He's been involved with the Canadian Chestnut Council for the past 13 years and has been its chair for nine years. The council manages a disease resistance breeding program that draws on the remaining healthy uh, American chestnut trees in Ontario, as well as stump sprouts that have survived the blight. Ron is currently restoring a 21 acre woodlot on his farm for habitat to support Carolinian wildlife and to encourage endangered species. And this includes a one acre research plot for the breeding of blight resistant American chestnut trees. He's director of the Elgin Stewardship Council and is a manager for the Almer Wildlife Management Area. Ron is a retired secondary school teacher and his interest in the American chestnut evolved from his teaching environmental science in school, as well as growing up on a farm where trees were ever present and fascinated him. He volunteers with numerous other environmental groups. Ron will introduce us to the American chestnut and the efforts of the council, an entirely volunteer organization like TFM, to preserve the unique Canadian American chestnut genome and breed a blight resistant tree for the future. Now, just on Q&A, after uh, Ron has finished his presentation, if you do have any questions, you have two ways of asking them. Number one, you can send your question directly to me via the chat feature. Just select me in chat and send me the question you have, and I'll collect and sift through them at the end of the presentation and then pose them to Ron. Or number two, actually during the Q&A period, you can raise your hand using the reaction feature and then ask your, direct, your question directly to Ron. Okay, now, Ron, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Again, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, allowing me to present the American chestnut. Uh, so this view here is of our uh, land at Onondaga Farm, which is at the Tim Hortons Children Camp at St. George, just off Highway 24 north of uh, Brantford. Okay, why is perfect? 
Uh, why is it not advanced? Something has happened here. I'm going to reload it. Sorry. Why is it not responding? Ron, it might, you might just hit your, um, your space bar. Um, okay. Try that. Sorry about that. It worked yeah, before. Uh, oh. No, I got you. There. Apologies. No worries. What am I? Damn. Yeah, you had share screen there, but we're not seeing your, we're seeing it now. Well, there's a long list on a black background. Okay, so it's. Ron, you just want to get your um, presentation up on your screen and then you'll be able to share it. Yeah just in, in your PowerPoint or whatever application you're using, just get it, get, get it up there. Screen share, yeah, that looks like it. Is that so, it? Okay. Yeah, now do you want to go back to the beginning of the presentation? And just double, double click on that PowerPoint presentation and then you should so be able not to, Yeah, we're not seeing it. You're not seeing it. Okay. What have I done wrong? Is it, can you see it on your screen? I'm seeing it on my screen, but I guess I'm not, it's not showing up on your screen. What I what I would maybe stop sharing and then go back and reshare again. That will reboot it. Try that. Okay. Share screen. There it is. Here. Now are you saying? Yep, we got it. Sorry. That's okay. No worries. No rush either. No. So are you so, seeing the first? Yep, that's great. Perfect. So then I think you can use the um, the now arrows. It yeah, it advanced for me. There this you time. go. Perfect. You got it. Okay, so the Canadian Chestnut Council acknowledges that the land on which we gather was the traditional territory shared between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Anishinaabe Nations, the Mississauga Nation, and the Ottawa Bronc Neutrals and the Huron Wendat, and that we share and respect the sacredness and culture of the American chestnut that has been passed on to us. So the Chestnut Council had, was established in 1988 by Dr. Colin McKean, uh, who was our founder. And we are a scientific and charitable organization with the mission to restore the American chestnut. And we basically have three objectives. Breed an American chestnut that is resistant to the blight, preserve and enhance the remaining Canadian population of the American chestnut, and to restore the American chestnut to its ecological, cultural, and economic roles in the community. So the importance of the chestnut is that it was once the dominant species in the Carolinian forest. Here in Southern Ontario, the chestnut 
probably made up 25% of all hardwoods, so one in four trees. And to the south of us, one in every three trees was probably an American chestnut. It was a keystone species. Uh, there's at least 275 organisms that depended upon the chestnut for either food or shelter um, or in some way. Um, almost 125 different butterflies and moths also were dependent upon the chestnut. It was also one of the super canopy trees, chestnut, tulip, and white oak were the three trees that would protrude from the normal canopy of the forest. And of course, this provided the roost and perches for our raptor population. It's our only native chestnut. The nuts were extremely important for mass for wildlife. They were also an important food source for First Nation and then colonists and in the more modern era, commercial interests. It produced a reliable, rot resistant and durable and workable timber source. And it was often referred to as the cradle to grave tree because almost everything made of wood that people used was chestnut. And of course, the fungus was introduced accidentally um, prior to um, quarantine rules about importing materials into North America and uh, we're paying the price. So it was considered a threatened species in 1987 and since 2007, it's considered endangered. It's also considered endangered federally. And it's a good picture of a lovely specimen of the tree. Without the maple leaves in the front corner there, the chestnut leaves are way up high. So the original range, the tree originally stretched from the southern states all the way up into Maine. And the story was always told that a squirrel in Georgia could make its way from tree to tree all the way to Maine and never leave the boughs of a chestnut tree. And that's how extensive. Here in Southern Ontario, we're an extension of the range from New York State across the North Shore of Lake Erie. And then we connect a little bit into uh, Michigan and the Northern corner of uh, Ohio there. And so it stretched from basically Grand Bend to Oakville and roughly follows the Carolinian zone for this area. Here in Ontario, there were probably 1.5 to 2 million chestnut trees still growing in Ontario prior to 1920. Uh, super canopy tree would grow up to be 35 meters. So that's roughly 11, almost 12 story tall. So if you think of an apartment building, it gives you an idea. And at the base, it could be up to three meters in diameter. The photograph there on the left is a tree taken in a picture taken in 1912 of an American chestnut in Norfolk County, and that has to be Dr. W. Um, White, who um, was the first forester in the province of Ontario, the official forester. And the lower picture is it showing the actual tree uh, growing on the grounds near St. Williams. Um, of course, it's not a forest tree, so it's kind of broad and short. It's a, a pasture tree, so it's not growing to its full height, and that's sort of much broader. Um, the chestnut in the original uh, appearance, the way it grows in the forest, was called the eastern redwood because of its height and diameter. So it was comparable to a redwood tree. So they call it the eastern redwood. Timber was excellent, used in everything. It's nice straight grain, easy to work, durable. Your cradle was made of it, your coffin was made of it. Every piece of wooden furniture that you used in your lifetime was made for that, it was sort of the Ikea wood. It was used for making musical instruments. 
also because of its rot resistance that explains why a lot of these um, wooden artifacts from the colonial period and um, early history survive in museums because they would normally not decay. Uh, the wood was also used for railroad ties, hydro poles, tel telegraph poles originally. Um, cord wood, uh, the picture there of the 1920s barn, there's actually a barn similar to this in much better condition <laughs> um, here in Elgin County. It's nearly 200 years old and the entire building is made of chestnut. The beams, the siding, even the shakes on the roof are all original and it looks as good as the day it was built. So a very important wood, entire houses would be built of um, chestnut. Um, some local churches here that we're trying to preserve are also constructed of chestnut. So a very important timber tree. The nuts, very important cash crop. They could be roasted, they were sold by street vendors, as already mentioned. They could be roasted, boiled, dried, candied. Um, they were used in all sorts of um, different foodstuffs. And they were also a staple food for First Nations. Uh, for First Nations, chestnut is fairly edible for at least two years, as long as you keep it dry. Uh, after two years, it gets fairly hard, and you would they would grind it into um, chestnut flour, put it in a leather pouch, hang it up at the top of the longhouse. The smoke would keep the insects out and they could keep it for an additional five years. And so the Ottawa drops or the neutrals from this area basically had a seven year supply of food always in storage, which made them an extremely um, powerful tribe. Uh, because they didn't have to depend on agriculture as much as the neighboring tribes. And that's where they get their name from neutrals because no one wanted to fight with them. Um, in modern times, of course, it can be milled into flour and it is a gluten free product. The nuts are now being used in confectionaries and beer making, it has the same nutrition as corn or rice. And the Great thing about chestnut, it has no allergic responses known. Um, and that's because it doesn't contain very much oil. And oil is usually the thing that triggers a re allergic response. The nuts were also used to fatten livestock, in particular pork. Um, hogs raised on chestnuts have a very distinct flavor in the meat. And the Chicago market used to give a 50 cent a pound premium for chestnut fed hogs. And it was actually a major income for farmers because uh, the hogs would be just let out into the forest to forage for themselves. And so there was very little uptake or very little cost of raising the pork. Tannins were another major component up until the second world, or sorry, up to until the first world war, um, chestnut bark and wood was used for extracting tannins that were used for the leather industry um, and formed the mass, vast majority. Of course, with the demise of the tree that we switched into more chemical tanning processes. But the University of Toronto and the University of Calgary have contacted us in the last year or two about trying to restore um, the tannin industry using the chestnut materials again and get away from the uh, petrochemical process that we've adopted since the First World War. Another important thing about the chestnut is its support of the ecology system or ecological systems. So it was an important mass tree and also provided shelter. Uh, the one thing about chestnut is it pro produces the crop of nuts every year. Hickories and oaks and other nut bearing trees uh, generally have a two to five year cycle of when they produce large amounts. And there are years when they produce very little. 
wildlife could depend on the chestnut to have a crop there every year. And depending on environment here in, in Ontario, the trees ripen in September and then further south it's October and November. So for migratory animals like the passenger pigeon, they would follow the ripening of the chestnuts and migrate south. Um, and of course, the extinction part of the extinction of the passenger pigeon was the loss of the chestnut, along with a lot of other factors. Um, with the decline of the chestnut, they've recorded the decline of black bears, gray squirrels, chipmunks, wild turkeys, gray foxes, of course, which was the fox of the forest, wild or white-tailed deer, ruffled gouse, all these organisms depended upon the chestnut for food supply. So with the demise of the chestnut, so dropped their food supply. Now the goshawk wouldn't eat chestnut, but it relied upon other organisms that fed on the chestnut. So white feet or white footed mice, the Allegheny wood rat, which is now is currently endangered in the States. And that so with those populations declining, the goshawk declined. Same is true of Cooper's hawks, who eat small songbirds, because the songbirds relied upon the insects and the butterflies that fed off of the leaves of the chestnut. And of course, the last one there, brook trout. Um, chestnut leaves are very high in nutrients and particularly proteins. And so the leaves of the chestnut, uh, when they fell into streams and form, form the leaf pack, and fed the benthic macroinvertebrates, all the little stoneflies and damsel and dragonfly larvae. They would grow much faster and larger on chestnut leaves. And of course, if you get all those larger insects, you produce bigger brook trout. And so there was a very interconnected relationship that we're just starting to understand really of all the things that were going on there. So the blight kind comes in, um, right now the best estimate is about 1876. Uh, there was a importation of 12 Japanese chestnuts to the first tree nursery, mail order tree nursery in New Jersey. Uh, the disease wasn't recognized until 1904 when it attacked the um, roughly 300 chestnut trees in the botanical gardens in New York City. Um, estimates say it spread about 50 miles per year. For here in Ontario, it swept into the Niagara Peninsula in 1924, and by the end of 1925, it was to Windsor. So it basically took two growing seasons to sweep through and destroy the trees here in southern Ontario. Sorry, I was gonna, here on the right is a canker formed by a chestnut blight. Blight attacks the cambium layer of the tree, which produces the xylem to the interior to form new sapwood and the phloem, which is to the outside, which forms the bark. When the cambium layer is attacked, it causes this sunken depression. And that tells you that you've got the disease. The one on the left that's got the splits in it, that's the indication that that tree is trying to bite off the blight. So it forms a swelling. So a sinking in is the blight killing the tree and the swelling is an indication that the tree is trying to defend itself. So that's a short history of our overview. <laughs> There's lots more I could tell you, but um, so this is what we've been doing. So we've got seven key things that we have developed over the years that we concentrate our efforts on, surveying and analysis of the remaining trees, breeding the blight resistant chestnut, breaking isolation, which is to produce nuts, gene conservation, seed colonies, DNA analysis, hypovirulence, and micropropagation. 
So I'll talk about those now. So in a surveying, um, back in 1995 and 96, there was the first official survey of surviving American chestnut, and they identified 800 trees. And so this map gives a rough location of them. Um, biggest concentration, of course, is in Norfolk and the east end of Elgin County. But you see, they stretch all the way from Windsor into the Niagara Peninsula and that. Now, we've tried to do a survey every 10 years. So the first official survey was done in 2004, we completed the one in 2014, and we have one scheduled for in two years. And in that, these other surveys, we now have up to 2,500 trees identified. And we're still getting trees identified. Um, I've got one that I have to check out here just south of me in Elgin County. So we do find trees that are still showing up. So what have we learned from our tree surveys? Well, in 13 years, we lost a little over 21% of our wild trees. And we only recruited 0.3%. Per, um, so we lost well over 100 trees and we only gained seven recruits. Um, by recruit means a young tree that's actually growing up from a nut. So some of the problems we have, of course, blight is still around. Uh, despite the Endangered Species Act, there's still illegal cutting because some people don't want an endangered species on their property. Some of our trees have reached their ripe old age of somewhere between 500 to 800 years old and they're dying. Uh, there's been a resurgent and other pests and diseases that I'll talk about later that also are impacting. Isolation, uh, these two trees here are isolated trees. They have no partners, so they can't reproduce and they would just either succumb to the blight eventually or die of old age and not ever produce another nut. Habitat loss, um, different things. We had one tree go over the cliff into Lake Erie because of where it was growing. It's on an eroding embankment. And the biggest thing we're probably finding is canopy suppression. Chestnut is a mid tolerant to shade. And if the canopy gets too heavy over a young tree, um, actually will shade out and the chestnut will die unless we can open up the canopy. So mortality rate is almost 2% per year. The blight infections in our native trees is increasing steadily. Um, well over 35% now. The number of trees that are actually reproducing is down from nearly 17% down to 11%. We only had seven new recruits found. And uh, according to uh, the model, uh, the chestnut would disappear from Ontario in about 150 years unless we intervene. So it's on its way to extinction. Um, so from those results, we're doing ongoing studies and in-depth analysis of the data. And so we've, the University of Guelph, a number of the uh, grad students there have produced um, a number of or papers on environmental factors limiting the recovery of the species. Uh, they're identifying habitat and microenvironment requirements for the tree. And we're also working on best forestry practices, how to keep the trees alive and survive. So canopy suppression is limiting tree growth and preventing sexual maturity of the tree. Um, closed canopy is also smothering out the chestnut stumps, which can regenerate. They do coppicing. So a chestnut tree will die. The blight will kill the tree down to the root collar. But the root collar and the roots remain uninfected and alive, and the root collar will send out coppices. And so chestnut stump can live up to 800 to maybe 1,000 years. 
if it's got sunlight. Uh, tree stumps that get covered by a canopy will die from lack of photosynthesis. We found that chestnut is an association with hickory, red oak, and white pine here in Southern Ontario. Uh, there's different associations if you go down into the States, but that's the one we find. There's also blight vectors, plants that are, are tree, shrubs that are unaffected by the blight, but are carriers, vectors. So sassafras and sumac, and of course the sumacs are quite prevalent. Uh, sassafras, especially here along the North Shore. So we're looking at proposing selective thinning to remove adjacent trees to open the canopy to let the light in so the trees survive. We're providing sexual partners for cross-pollination. Um, removal of light vectors, uh, which is controversial because sassafras and sumac are native species. And we're looking at um, reintroducing populations and how to do that sustainably. Uh, so that's the major thing that we're working on now. In the breeding program, uh, goes back uh, 21 years now. Um, we had two breeding programs. One was to produce a hybrid, which was 97% American chestnut and 3% Chinese, Japanese, European, which we hope they would have a resistance from those. We're also doing a breeding program where we see enough native light resistance that we've been breeding 100% American chestnut of Canadian origin. So we have three research sites, the Tim Hortons Children's Camp, which is on Onondaga's farm, my site here on my farm, and uh, we have a repository at um, Riverbend Farm here in Elgin County too. Uh, but it's not as active, it's uh, been kind of mothballed. So this is our breeding program. Uh, the back cross hybrids, uh, we've achieved about 98.45% American. So the mother trees are all here from Canadian. The father trees are from the Connecticut Research Station. Um, provided, the pollen was provided by Dr. Sandra Aganagatakis, um, who is one of the Americans leading researchers in chestnut. So she provided pollen from three of her best trees, and I've just listed out the cross breeding there. So the pollen was brought here, we crossed it with our trees, and that's our hybrid. And so we are in the our sixth and seventh generation of this back cross hybrid. But our main focus has now been switched over to breeding a Canadian 100% American. So 26 trees that were selected out of the population. And again, we used 26 father trees to provide the pollen. And so the that's the basis of our pure trees. Now we've been adding trees into those 26 families of trees and we keep the two breeding programs separated. Um, the hybrid initially was our main focus, but we found that our 100% American were doing just as well as our hybrids in resisting blight. And just for those scientists, the mother trees are all of Canadian origin, and that's to maintain the mitochondrial and chloroplastic DNA content. So that way we keep the tree um, is most similar to what has survived here in Ontario. So this is the Tim Horton on the Daga Farms site. Uh, we've got approximately 20 acres there. And so the initial planning is out. We're started in 2001, and we are basically used up our land allotment there. So we're actually looking for more land to plant on. This is a photograph from uh, my farm. So some pictures from 2011, and the bottom picture there is from probably four years ago. The trees are planted fairly close together because 
We want them to go grow upward. So we're trying to mimic a forestry, a forest condition where the trees are in competition. The plastic is to keep the weeds down. We water them, we fertilize them. And this is to force the tree into a reproductive state in five years instead of waiting 15 years. So um, we try to speed up the reproductive cycle so that uh, we have a chance to do some breeding. Inoculation is where we actually test the tree. Once the tree has a diameter of three and a half centimeters, we deliberately wound the tree with a cork bore and we stick in a piece of blight. So on the Petri dish is the actual chestnut blight. We insert it into the tree, we tape it, and then we come back and we measure in May, August, and the following May to see how the tree has responded. And by measuring the growth rate, of the size of the canker or wound gives us a good idea of what trees are going to resist and what trees are not going to resist. So an example here, on the left, all those little orange pustules are the blight. And the, you can see where the cork borer wound was made and the blight was in, introduced and the black magic marker is outlining. This tree is not doing a very good response. The bark is sinking. There's nothing happening at the edge. And this tree will probably be dead within a season because the blight will go all the way around the trunk and it will girdle it. The one on the right, again, you can see that sunken area that's orange. But you'll notice that the black magic marker, there is a raised border. This is the callus. This is what we want the tree to do. The callus is the tree trying to seal off the blight infection. And if you can get this callus to form, that spot where the blight is will die and the tree will slowly close over that wound. That is the resistance we want. We haven't found our perfect tr tree yet, but that's the response we want is that callousing. And we do find some trees in the nature that actually ha it has worked out. And so we've included them into our breeding program. So to date, we've got about 1700 first generation seedlings in. 900 hybrids and roughly 800 native trees. So F1s are first generation crosses. We have about 34,000 F2s, the second cross. So the best trees of our F1 that showed most resistance were used to create the F2s. Um, last year, we planted just over 2,000 additional F2s. Our first F3s, the third generation crosses, were made in 2019 and we've established our orchard in 20. And we now have 600 trees as of last fall in our first F3 orchard. And so now we're gonna create another F3 orchard. Um, these trees should be able to produce the fourth generation and we believe the fourth generation nuts will be resistant to the blight. So that's where our hopes lie. Um, we just got under 5,000 nuts in stratification and actually the 5,000 nuts have been planted in, at the greenhouses at Simcoe Research Station um, run by the University of Guelph. And they'll be ready for plant out this um, August. Uh, with COVID, we've learned something. Uh, COVID shut down. We normally would plant tree uh, seedlings or seeds out in February and plant the trees out into the research plots in June. Uh, with COVID, we couldn't plant in February. We only got to plant our 
uh, seeds in April. So there was no way we could plant them in June. So we planted it in um, September. We've done that now for two years. And what we found is that our survival rate by planting in September is almost 95%. Whereas our spring planting could run anywhere from 40 to 80% survival, depending on how hot and dry the summer was. So we've decided to switch to fall planting. So it's one benefit that we've learned from COVID, um, that chestnut prefers to be planted out in the fall. Breaking isolation, um, a lot of our wild trees are geographically isolated. And chestnut is self-incompatible. It means two trees to tango. So you need two trees within probably 200 feet of each other to be able to cross-pollinate and produce nuts. So a lot of our trees have been standing there for over 100 years and haven't been able to reproduce. They'll flower, but with no pollen source, there's no fertilization. They'll produce all sorts of burrs, but the burrs will be filled with aborted nuts because of non-fertilization. And so this is a major problem. So this is the sand hills at Pelham, and the red arrow is pointing out the isolated chestnut on the side of this hill. So the solution is we take in seven to 12 grafted American chestnuts of great genetic variation. So from other parts of, of um, the region and we plant them out. And so you can see I, the red arrows there are pointing out the tree guards on three of the 12 that we planted around the mother tree there. We use etylated grafted trees and they'll start flowering within two years. Sometimes they'll flower within the first year. Um, and etylated is basically you're taking mature um, cyan off the tree and you're grafting it onto a germinated nut that is undifferentiated. And so we can trick the tree into reproducing in two years rather than producing in 15 years. So this feeds up the natural cycle of flowering, pollination, fertilization, and nut production. And of course that starts recruitment. If you've got nuts, you can recruit trees. Increase the genetic rec recombination. And we have done 60 sites completed in 10 counties. And we're hoping to do more. The biggest thing is um, canopy suppression. Now there are some drawbacks to grafted trees are not resistant and so they're susceptible to blight. We could accidentally introduce blight to an isolated tree. And of course, closed canopy limits the light. So that's some of our concerns. Gene conservation. Um, what you're looking at is a dead chestnut. Wherever it didn't die of the blight, it's died from some other reason. So isolated trees that haven't been able to exchange, we're slowly losing that genetic diversity. So what we want to do, what we're trying to do is collect as much material off of these trees that are in decline and clone them. And then bring all these various clones together to maintain the genetic genome for the Canadian trees and prevent the loss of any more genes from the gene pool. So sign are collected from all the wild isolated trees and grafted onto native seeds. So that's etylated grafting. And then we start with groupings of 25. And then over the years, we build this up into a colony of anywhere from 200 to 275 trees. Uh, Yarmouth Natural Heritage, area is close to me and it's with the Catfish Conservation Authority. They're providing this area. So what you're seeing there is the first 25 trees put up with tree guards because substantial tree guards because uh, you plant a chestnut, the deer will find it and they'll eat it to the ground. Um, so we need to pr 
promote, protect them. And we do these gene conservation nodes or seed colonies in areas that lack chestnut. And so this is trying to reintroduce. Um, these trees will start producing nuts. The squirrels and chipmunks will carry them off into the neighboring woods and we'll slowly get our chestnut back into the population of hardwoods. So also increasing the genetic recombination because we've got trees that would normally never come in contact with each other. They could be two, two, three, 10, 20 miles apart. But by taking the clones and putting them in close proximity, it allows for lots of recombination. And when you get all that recombination, nature might just spontaneously throw that light resistant offspring along the way because she can do a much better job of it than we can. So we establish these colonies in areas that are lacking chestnuts. And we have 31 colonies now established in 10 counties. And that's another project. Same sort of problems. Uh, there's limited light resistance in the native trees we're using. So the colonies are prone to infection. So we need to monitor and we destroy trees that are showing blight symptoms rather than let the blight spread. DNA analysis is a very important thing here. Um, we're using it to identify what is an American chestnut so we can tell it from the other chestnuts. Uh, you may be familiar with butternut. Uh, it turned out that the butternut here in southern Ontario was highly contaminated with other species of um, walnuts. And there's actually a very small minority of true butternut that still survive. So we did the DNA analysis to make sure that we were dealing with pure American chestnuts. So we're up to we started with one unique uh, identifier marker in the genetics. We're now up to 16. So we can pick out a pure American chestnut very well now. Um, and from this process, uh, we've eliminated, initially we eliminated nine trees from our program because they turned out to be some sort of non-native American chestnut. And most recently, we just had, with some more markers, we eliminated four other trees. So we're confirming the purity of our American chestnuts. It's also helped us to identify geographic variations and genetic diversity in the species. Um, so there's actually three subpopulations of American chestnuts here in Southern Ontario that we need to take a look at. Um, and right now, uh, one of our grad students at the University of Guelph is trying to determine the gene loci for the genes that are responsible for blight resistance. Uh, the Americans have mapped out the DNA sequence for the um, chestnut, but no one's determined which of the loci are responsible for the actual resistant properties. So we're looking forward to her work in the next few years. She's doing that for a doctor. So we use electro, um, electrophoresis um, in the process, and that's what the photograph is of. So there's no major contamination of the gene pool and the 13 trees that we have identified are no longer in our um, breeding program. And we've also removed any prodigy that we've taken out of those, from those trees. There's three genetically different subpopulations of chestnut in Ontario. And we continue to find unique American chestnut markers for the Canadian species. So one of the things that's come out now just last fall is that the Canadian American chestnut is genetically unique. And it's now called the Northwest Range. And the Northwest range here in Canada is genetically most similar to the chestnuts in the Southeast range in Georgia. And we're very different from the chestnuts that you would find in the New England states or along the Appalachia, which is um, where the heart of the chestnut is. 
So the reasons that they proposed for this is divergence of the post-glacial remigration routes. Um, somehow the Canadian chestnuts started in Georgia and we believe must have came up the Mississippi Valley into the lower Great Lakes. And that's a possible route. They definitely did not come up the Appalachia or come up the East Coast. So the Mississippi is the only other route we can think of. Um, there's been effective reproduction isolation of the Northwest population from the, Amer the uh, mainland United States. And a higher migration route in the north, south north direction than along the Appalachia axis is potentially um, by human mediated migration. Um, a recent book has come out indicating that the mound builders um, relied on the chestnut fairly prominently and they're in the Mississippi Valley. And they think that maybe they're the ones that brought the chestnut north into the um, lower Great Lakes because in this area, the Saugeen culture or Saugeen complex culture was the um, extension of the mound builders to the south. So it's an, it's an interesting thing that historically. So our latest research, um, genetic diversity is good. Our heterozygonicity is at just about 0.7. And that's comparable to all the other chestnuts, Chinese, Japanese, European, um, Korean, which means that we have enough genetic material that we're not going into an inbreeding program or anything. So this is, that was good news for us. And um, one of our researchers at Guelph did that. Hybridization has been minimized. Um, those are the four trees that she just located. Um, this is uh, Sophia Stoltz. So those have been removed. The other thing is she's done an analysis of genetic clusters and it's color coded here because I want to keep it simple. Um, but there's a distinct red genetic cluster concentrated in the Canadian trees. And so if you look at the map, you'll see that in the little pie shapes there, red is the dominant color across the Canadian. And when we look down south, orange is the dominant clustering of thing and just small amount of red. And if you went farther south, you'd find that in Georgia, you get this clustering of red again. Um, the east coast are yellow. And the blue that's showing up there is um, non-American. So the, those were used as controls. So showing that the Canadian tree is very distinct from the other trees in the United States proper. And this was backed up by um, Garris' uh, work. He did leaf morphology and he found that our trees, the leaves are less hairy and we have shorter leaf stems, shorter petioles. So it's kind of a neat thing that we're finding that our trees are unique and it kind of fulfills the thing that we wanted to find a Canadian solution for our trees and not bring in stuff from the States. And that's why our hybrid program with the American, uh, they originate with the American pollen, has kind of gone to the back burner because we want to preserve our native species. So hypovirulence is a biological control and it's a virus that gives the blight an infection weakens the blight so that the natural defenses of the chestnut tree can take over. It was highly successful in Europe. That's how the European chestnut survived. Here in North America, we have had no or limited regional success with it. And there's a reason that we'll, I'll explain in a second. So our hypervalence goes back to 86. We infected the trees with various viruses to fight the blight. There was no observable um, reaction. 
for a number of years. But then in 2014, when we were surveying the trees, three of the original trees uh, showed hypovirulence. Um, and so we've reopened the investigation. Now, why was hypovirulence successful in Europe? Well, in Europe, they've only got six strains of the virus or six strains of the blight. Here in North America, we have over 200 strains of blight. So we have to find over 200 different viruses to infect the various forms of blight. And that's why in Minnesota, they have hypovirulence working, but it's on outside the normal range. They probably only have a few of the actual 200 blight infections there. And so their viruses work. The interesting thing is if you take a tree from that's grown in Minnesota and bring it back to Michigan or Ontario, it dies of the blight. So it's the isolation of those trees growing in Minnesota and their lack of contact with all the different forms of blight that are running loose in North America. Micropropagation is um, a cult tissue culture. And this was done by Dr. Christy Lovett at McGill University for us. And so she's taking a cell and she's growing it into a plantlet that is blight free. And these are actual photographs. And this is work has been done before, but the biggest thing was you can grow the plantlet, but it won't develop proper roots. And you'll see in the bottom right slide there, she's got it to grow with proper roots. So you could get a chestnut seed or chestnut clone, but it wouldn't produce proper roots, so you couldn't plant it out. So this we this is planning ahead in that we want to be able to, when we do get our resistant tree, we want to be able to mass produce it so that we can get it out for ecological restoration very rapidly. At the same time, we also want to mass produce the tree for commercial purposes, for planting timber uh, plantations and for nut production. And so try to restore the tree as fast as we can. So we've got the micropropagation worked out, thanks to uh, Dr. Lovett. And so we're ready to get our tree out. So the challenges are preserving the unique Canadian genome of the Canadian genome of the American chestnut and its three subpopulations, development of our best forestry practices, reversing any genetic narrowing in the breeding program. We're still a little antsy there. Uh, compatibility of reproduction. Not all our native chestnuts will pollinate each other. There's some seems to be some incompatibility there. So we're working on that. New threats. Well, the chestnut gall wasp has been here in Canada now, and it will eventually kill the tree over about five years. Chestnut sawfly is coming back. Brown chestnut rot has shown up in Pennsylvania for the first time, which is just across the lake. And of course, with us planting out all these chestnut trees, there's been a resurgence of the greater and lesser chestnut weevils. So Mother Nature is throwing a few curves at us that we have to deal with. Climate change is altering the environment and weather patterns, which we're also looking at. Uh, with warmer weather, the northern migration of black ink disease, which is a root rot, which kills trees in the southern states. Um, we've had one incident in Essex County where a tree was a hot, humid summer, had lots of southern winds and lots of humidity up from the Gulf, and we think it black, died of black ink disease. Now, the fungus that causes this, probably winter killed. But as the climate changes, black ink disease will migrate northward. And of course, our other concern is the genetically modified American chestnut by the New York University at Syracuse, Darling 58. It's now in front of the EPA in the States to uh, be released. Um, 
we've sent a formal protest to the EPA, um, as, as a number of other groups have, that this tree is not an American chestnut and therefore should not be released. Um, but it's one of our concerns. So a little bit of a summary. We've got 37,000 American chestnuts planted out in addition to the little over 2,000 wild trees. So we've stabilized the population and we're hopefully we're stabilizing the genome. We've got our F3s out. Things we're interested in is the mycorrhizal connection, the wood wide web, uh, which looks at um, how fungi involved with intra and interspecies communication. Um, if you've read Suzanne Samard's book, uh, searching for the mother tree. So we're interested in that, if there's a relationship there that we could use. Uh, manipulating the forest to promote the chestnut and minimize blight pressure, hypervalence, climate uh, mitigation tree. Uh, if we can get a chestnut to grow to 115 feet, it will hold a lot of carbon because as big as a tree is on top, it's twice as big underground. So for carbon sequestering, and actually there's a group in the States that's turning this into a business of planting chestnut orchards. Now they're using a hybrid to sequester carbon. And that's, um, there's actually an investment thing. Assisted migration, um, we know that the chestnut will grow much farther north. There are viable trees at Sault Ste. Marie and at North Bay that are producing nuts. And we've been planting the tree farther north and they're surviving and they're being viable. And most recently this year, we finally got a stewardship agreement under the Endangered Species Act from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks for 15 years to take care of the chestnut. There's our sponsors, which we like to acknowledge, and questions. And I'm way too long, sorry. Ron, thank you, <clears throat> thank you so much. That was so fascinating to see how a group of volunteers are able to steward the restoration of tree like this in Ontario. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, I have one question from Anne. Um, I think earlier you'd mentioned the problem of planting endangered trees on private property. And she asks, why wouldn't somebody want to have an endangered tree on their property? <laughs> Part of my job since uh, the Endangered Species Act is actually convincing people that the government is not going to come and seize your land um, uh, and that we just want access to the tree. And uh, out of maybe a hundred cases, I've only had three people outright refuse. They don't want to have anything to do with uh, endangered species. <clears throat> And in some cases, um, they've actually destroyed the tree. And that's mm -hmm. one of the weak things about the Endangered Act. It says that you're forbidden to cut, destroy an endangered species, but there's no teeth. There's no punishment for actually doing it. Right. So one of those weak things that, for whatever reason, was never put in. Um, but sometimes we get... And we have a number of people that um, we have to register the trees with the government, but we have a number of trees that aren't registered with the government. And that's the way we got access to them. We agreed to, we want this tree included. We want you involved. Um, so it's not on the registry. It's on our registry, but not the official registry. And so I guess we skirt the law a little bit by mean, I'd rather have the tree involved and this person involved rather than the opposite way where you get a person that's uh, outright um, 
destructive of it. Right. Great. Um, here's another question from Michelle. Um, could you talk just a little bit about the three different types of Canadian genome? Um, how are they different and why is this the case that there have been three genomes that have developed in the population? You mean the subpopulation? In the subpopulation, it's, yeah. Yeah, the subpopulation, um, basically you've got Essex, Kent, Lamb, uh, Lambeth, um, and the western halves of Middlesex and Elgin seem to be a cluster. Then eastern part of Elgin and they're a cluster into Norfolk and then the Niagara Peninsula. And it's probably climate. There's slight variations. There's soil variations there. Um, the interesting thing is when you look at the um, original surveys that were done, the original surveyors that did this area, they recorded the dominant trees. And so chestnut comes out very prominently in some areas where we can't grow chestnut anymore um, in the West Elgin area, it's heavy clay. And chestnut does not grow well in heavy clay, but historically it did. So there's some, there's some genetic variations that we don't quite understand. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, and they're very, they're very subtle. Um, we, we're not certain if we have to preserve those three subpopulations, but they've shown up that there's just a slight change um, part of it could be that the Niagara Peninsula has been influenced from pollen blowing over from New York State. The Essex, the Western population, um, there's some indication that Michigan and Ohio, Northern Ohio weren't originally isolated, that the chestnut probably came up through the Mississippi. And so there's an influence there. And here us in the central part, we haven't had those, so we're slightly different again. And I think if you go back to the colored pie charts, you'll see that there's a difference between the east, west. Hamilton has a fair bit of um, yellow in it. Mm -hmm. And so does Essex. So it could indicate that there's some pollen is blowing and isolation wasn't as uh, current. Right. I'm speculating now um, because that's an area we're still looking at. We're trying to find more markers. Interesting. Um, another question from Ellen. Um, which Canadian universities are the biggest actors in the American chestnut research and either in Canada or the US, which ones do you work mo most closely with? And um, are there foundations that support the council? How do you, when you, like TFN, you operate with volunteers. Do you, you don't seem to have any staff. Do you have grants that help you carry on your work? Okay, well, the university wide, our, our main connection is with the University of Guelph. Um, and that's just historical. Um, we subcontract through them. Um, our principal investigators are professors there. So we have um, Dr. Brian Husband, he's the one that is, he's an ecologist. So he is, he lines up our grad students to do research. Um, we have had, we've had outreach to Carleton in Ottawa. Um, the connection to McGill in Quebec was through uh, a former Guelph student who had done postdoc work at um, Syracuse in the States. So she was familiar with um, the genetically modified tree. Um, so that's that connection. We have some individuals in private industry, in the horticultural industry that provide us some of the technical assistance. And um, we're always outreaching. We keep in good, fairly good contact with the American Chestnut Foundation. Um, over the last few years, we've had six, seven different speakers from the states 
So we try to keep up with the, what the Americans are doing, our connection with the Connecticut Research Farm and that. So we try to remain aware of what's going on and we exchange. And um, actually the Americans borrow from us quite heavily, our grafting techniques and some of our propagation techniques. The Americans, we developed them and we shared them with them. That's so um, we've made some, some progress. As for funding, um, we rely heavily on species at risk, stewardship fund, species at risk research fund. Uh, when the government has money, we've had the Ontario Trillium um, Foundation provide us this money uh, in the past. Um, donations. Are a big thing, but actually, um, and we do, we do fundraising, which we absolutely have to. And we've gotten um, some agricultural grants, um, specifically for nut size and the commercialization of agriculture or of the chestnut. Um, but that's one of our biggest headaches is is raising money um, because. Um, we usually, we've gotten to the point now where we spend about a hundred and five to hundred and ten thousand dollars a year, and so it's a lot of money to raise. We have one person that is employed, and that is our, we call him our technician. It's Doctor um, Dragon um, Gallus. Sorry, he's with the University of Guelph. And so he provides us with all our technical work, gets out everything, arranges things for us. And so he's our only employee, the, all the rest are volunteers. Great. And of course we get land, land donated and that sort of thing. Great, thanks. Um, I, have, I have an additional question and then I think Ellen, we probably need to wrap up at that point. Um, our membership, TFN, our um, Toronto field naturalists have been active for a hundred years uh, in Toronto supporting um, walks, lectures, and other restoration activities in the ravines and the natural areas of Toronto. Once you find a light resistant tree, um, what would be the prospects of American chestnuts reappearing in Toronto parks and natural areas? What would it take to make that happen? Well, our, our plan is to, once we have our resistant trees, um, we're planning on basically distrib distributing them, ideally at no cost, or maybe just uh, production recovery costs sort of things. But basically the Chestnut Council, we voted on this several years ago that we would not profit from the um, restoration of the tree. Um, the government money's gone into it. We put the thing, the whole part would be, once the tree is produced, will dissolve. <laughs> um, but basically, it goes back to the province of Ontario. Now, the University of Guelph has some um, uh, proprietary rights. Uh, but the Chestnut Council, we would waive our proprietary rights. Right. So, but the plan is to mass produce the trees and redistribute them into conservation. And that's why we're doing a lot of work with conservation authorities and provincial parks, right. trying to get the tree back out and at least be a, people that are aware of that the tree does exist. Right. Well, I, I would think it would be a great match for the city of Toronto with its biological diversity policy and planning to, uh, and it's also emphasis on native trees to, to um, support the, the um, planting and nourishment of those trees in our parks. So I'm sure you'll have a great partner here once you find that tree. Well, well, actually it'll be more than one tree because you don't, Takes two to tango. So right. we're holding <laughs> right. 20 or 30 different blight resistant so that the genetics 
is stays normal, that we don't get an inbred tree. That happens in the States with their restoration tree about 10 years ago. Okay. You mm -hmm. just can't have a single gene line. Great. Well, Ron, thank you so much for that presentation and um, absolutely fascinating and a wonderful story of what a group of volunteers with um, very modest support can do over a period of years to get an important uh, species reestablished in Ontario. It's a really, it's a great story that needs to get out there. Thank you again. Um, well, thank Ellen? you for... Yes, um, th Over to thank, you. thank you, Ron. Um, that was uh, that was really inspiring, and and you know, thank you to to all the other people that you work with because um, it's it's an extraordinary story, and you really are playing a long game, and and uh, so I, I think so much depends on it, and and uh, anyway, it's very very inspiring, and we'll definitely write this up in our newsletter. Uh, and uh, we will also uh, make sure that the the um, recording is is available to to a broader public. So so that will really um, make a difference. Now I just want to wrap up things very briefly with a couple of notes for people to um, to uh, get in your calendars. But just before we sign off here, and. Um, I, I want to make sure that we know that uh, we have a bunch of walks for Toronto Field Naturalist members um, that take us uh, in May to, to all these different wonderful locations. So we all know that we have to pre-register and uh, use the members pages of the Toronto Field Naturalist website. Um, things really are blooming. You are able to see morning cloaks right now. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a really terrific time of year to be out there. Um, I also want to remind you that this is not the la last lecture of our season. On Thursday evening, May 19 at 7 p.m., we have Jason Ramsey Brown, our, our past president, talking about our own project, the Cottonwood Flats project in the Don Valley. And many, many Toronto Field Naturalist volunteers head out there in all kinds of weather, um, all over, over the, the whole growing season to help monitor and track and report uh, the restoration that's going on there. And we have the reports issued annually on our website to prove that. And so it's a really um, a fruitful partnership with the city of Toronto. And Jason is able to pull that story together for us, pull all the data together. And it, it makes for, for quite an inspiring story as well. So please don't miss that um, because, because it's, it's something that Toronto Field Naturalists can be proud of. I want to remind us all that um, this is the season when we do want to renew our memberships with the Toronto Field Naturalists, and it might be the um, it might be the walks that uh, that keep you connected with this, with our community, the people that you want to connect with uh, periodically, or it was just one particular walk that really was uh, life changing. You never know, and um, it's it's worth rejoining for that reason. It may be that. The lectures are what uh, keep you connected with the TFN and that you're learning fascinating things just like we did this afternoon. It might be the 100th anniversary coming up that you want to help celebrate. It might be the fact that the Toronto Field Naturalists speak up for nature at City Hall on a regular basis and that you want to support that. Whatever your reason is, um, it's, it's uh, worth doing that renewal and, and, and getting that in your calendar as soon as possible. And uh, that's it, really. So I appreciate your time on a, on a lovely uh, spring afternoon. And uh, we hope to see you again on Thursday, May 19, in the evening at 7 o'clock. So thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Ron. I hope you get out there and <laughs> have a little bit of fresh air now. <laughs> Oh, Ron, could, <clears throat> could you send me your PowerPoint presentation because I'm writing it up and I'll send you a draft of it before we publish. Sure, I can do that for you. Great. And if anyone's got follow up questions, just give them my email. I'll okay. be glad to answer. Great. Thanks okay. so much, Ron. Take care. Absolutely. Bye bye. Okay. Bye bye. Take care, everybody. Bye bye.